One of the greatest obstacles to crafting health and wellness is identifying and controlling inflammation. It's at the core of all complex and chronic diseases, and it's the driving mechanism that underlies the most common symptoms that people like you struggle to overcome. Join us as we explore cutting-edge science and research to give you the information and tools you need to create the quality of life you want and deserve. And now, here is the host of Inflammation Nation, Dr. Stephen Nosworthy. So today we're going to continue talking about uh, hormone testing. And uh, what we'll do is we'll take a look at the different testing strategies when we're looking at either male or female hormones. And I believe I mentioned at the end of the last podcast that when, you, when you're testing hormones, it's not important only to decide are you going to test using saliva or blood testing, serum testing. And, and really the main decision point about whether you do use saliva or serum testing is what clinical question are you asking? And, and I'll just give you a two-second review on that. It, it, because every diagnostic test you run is you asking something of human physiology, whether it's, hey, what's your fasting blood sugar? Or what's your insulin levels? How's your thyroid system working? When we're testing for hormones um, with the, uh, the reproductive hormones, we're predominantly interested in two main questions. And one is, what is your system producing? And that's where blood testing and testing total or protein-bound hormone levels comes into play. And the other main question we ask is, what's available at the cellular level to drive function? And that's where we're more interested in free fraction hormone testing. And, and we can do that certainly in saliva. In some labs, we'll test some hormones as free fraction hormones in blood. And so a lot of that just depends on which lab you might be dealing with. Um, so let's move on and let's talk just a little bit about male and female testing. We're just going to kind of run this on. It, it'll take, well, it might take 10 minutes, might take 30. So we'll just kind of continue on with the episode here. Um, so for male testing, I did mention this in one of the prior episodes, is that when you look at male hormonal systems, they are far less complicated than the female system because we have... Um, reproductive life cycle in, in female hormone physiology, where you might have a woman who is in her menstrual years, and uh, then you have your perimenopausal state, which can last months to years, and then you have your postmenopausal state. And because with the the cycling woman, uh, hormones change, you know, let's say on average about every three days. Um, when you're testing hormones with a cycling woman, uh, it really depends. The answer you're getting or the snapshot you're getting when you're doing either saliva testing or serum testing is just indicative of that moment, unless you do something that we call a cycle map, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Let's start with the men. Um, in general, when we're looking at hormonal mechanisms, or let's call them laboratory patterns or patterns of dysfunction, we like to use labs to distinguish between primary and secondary hypogonadism. Let me say that again. We, we use labs to determine between primary and secondary hypogonadism. And what that means, the word primary and secondary uh, just simply points us to where the problem is. So a primary hypogonadism is where the gonadal system, testes in men, ovaries in women, is failing to produce hormones despite having normal signaling coming out of the pituitary gland. Remember, this is a an integrated feedback loop system where the hypothalamus talks to the pituitary. The pituitary then sends a hormonal signal, either LH or FSH, both in men and women, down to the gonads. And that hormonal signal then activates the, say, cellular machinery that ends up in the production of progesterone, estrogen, or testosterone, depending on which hormone system or which aspect of that we're looking at. So a primary hypogonadism basically says that the brain is signaling appropriately, but the gonadal system is failing to respond. So a primary hypogonadism tells us that the problem is actually at the gonadal level, either ovaries or testes. A secondary hypogonadism is where we have a hormone deficit, but the gonadal system itself, the ovaries and the testes, are intact. They're capable of making hormones at a sufficient level, but the signal coming from the brain is weak, so as a result, the testes or the ovaries only make a certain amount based on the strength of that brain-based signal. And so the problem is not with 
the testicular or the ovarian tissue itself. The problem is up in the brain, usually in the pituitary gland. Uh, technically, there is a tertiary hypogonadism, which involves the hypothalamus, but the hormones that come out of the hypothalamus, things like gonadotropin releasing hormone, are present in very, very small amounts. Um, and typically, there's um, generally genetic issues, which are relatively uncommon that drive that. So we usually talk in terms of either primary hypogonadism, where the problem's in ovaries and testes, um, or secondary hypogonadism, where the signal coming from the pituitary gland is, is not appropriate. And so in order to look at hormonal systems, it, you have to look at both. You have to look at the brain-based hormones, the luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone, and you have to look at the hormones that are the end product of how those signals coming the, from the pituitary uh, interact with the gonadal tissue in order to be able to pinpoint where the problem is. And here's a classic example. And to be honest, we see this all the time in practitioners that are relatively new to either conventional endocrinology or say functional endocrinology. And they say, hey, let's check your progesterone. And let's say it's a it's a woman in her, in her menstrual, she has her menstrual cycle. Um, so let's let's test your progesterone and let's be fancy and let's use saliva because we want to look at the free fractions biologically active. And so let's say that you just collect a single sample of saliva in a menstruating woman. Well, all you're looking at is the level of progesterone that was made on that day of, of what is theoretically a 28-day cycle where progesterone levels change every few days. And you're doing that without the benefit of understanding what's coming out of the pituitary. And so if I'm going to measure and make any type of clinical judgment on someone's progesterone levels, I want to make sure I'm looking at the corresponding pituitary hormone because without that, I can't tell if the problem, if progesterone is indeed low, I can't tell if the problem is with the ovaries not responding properly or if it's the signal coming out of the brain is too weak to make an intact ovarian system produce enough hormones. And it's very easy if you don't understand the complexity of, of how these systems work and, and all the different variables that go into you know choosing the right test and interpreting the information properly, it's very difficult to arrive at what the right clinical intervention is. For example, if the problem that you have is a secondary hypogonadism, meaning the problem's up in the brain, it's not with the ovaries, and let's say we're, we're looking at progesterone. The same applies for estrogen and testosterone as well. But let's say that we have a secondary hypogonadism where the problem is some kind of suppression or inhibition of the signal coming from the pituitary. We measure that with luteinizing hormone. And in fact, the ovaries are capable of producing enough progesterone if they had the proper signaling coming from the brain. Well, if we see low progesterone, but we don't realize that the problem is actually higher in the system in the brain itself, then someone gets prescribed progesterone which actually only further inhibits the brain's output of the initial signal that says, hey, let's make progesterone. And so that that just actually makes the problem worse and makes somebody completely dependent on exogenous hormones or taking it in pill or injection form when in fact that wasn't even the nature of the problem. And there are many things that can inhibit the pituitary gland's ability to make either luteinizing hormone or follicle-stimulating hormone. And I'm not going to give you a big list, but, but I will tell you that the most common culprits, if you will, let's call them the usual suspects, are, are grounded somewhere in the realm of um, inflammation and stress chemistry. And that can be, you know, both of those things can be relatively big and certainly they're interlinked. But as a general rule, if we have a secondary hypogonadism pattern, we're looking for whatever is suppressing the pituitary gland. And not, we're not worried that you can't actually make enough because you have a problem with ovaries or testes. We're looking for some kind of metabolomic or some, some abnormal body chemistry, something that's affecting the brain's ability. And if we can clear that obstacle and the pituitary begins to signal properly, then the intact gonadal system then responds appropriately because it's capable of doing that. This is one of the, the potential um, trips or traps, if you will, of having kind of a knee-jerk hormone replacement approach where just because you see a hormone is low, you immediately say, well, we need to give it to you because you're not making it. Well, we have to ask the question, why and where's the problem? This is where testing comes in. So let's kind of switch this around and, and start talking about hormonal testing for um, 
hormonal testing for men. And again, very simple, very simple hormonal map, if you will. Um, male hormones really don't change all that much. We don't have a menstrual cycle and all these different kinds of biological um, realities. So when we want to look at defining primary, secondary hypogonadism in a man, we want to look at two sets of hormone pairs. We want to, well, no, let me correct that. We want to look at paired testing that tells us about pituitary output as well as testicular response. And so in a man, luteinizing hormone or LH from the pituitary drives testosterone production, and then follicle stimulating hormone or FSH drives spermatogenesis. And so we want to look at both LH and FSH at the same time we measure testosterone. Now, whether we're able to do that in saliva depends on the lab. There's only one lab in the country that actually does the pituitary hormones um, from, from saliva. Uh, and that's a lab called Diagnostex. They're out in Kent, Washington. Been around for a very, very long time serving the functional medicine community. But certainly we can get FSH and LH in serum. And serum also allows us for the man and the woman to test not just total testosterone, but free or what's called bioavailable testosterone. And so we get the complete picture, right? But again, if you don't understand the complexity of how the system is designed and the pros and cons of each different testing strategy, or if you're not really clear on the question that you're asking of the body, it's very easy to make a mistake and come to the wrong conclusion. So an appropriate hormonal evaluation for androgen production or testosterone production in a man Includes not just total and free testosterone, but luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. And that way we can tell, is the problem in the pituitary gland with weak signaling or is the problem in the testes, meaning the testes are not producing testosterone despite getting a good signal coming down from the brain from the pituitary gland. Now, that's that's a very simplistic way to do it. It's accurate, it's clinical, it's valid, it's relevant. Um, but there are other issues with male hormone physiology, things like aromatization. And so we know that the aromatase enzyme is, it's just part of natural physiology for both men and women, but some men are hyper aromatizers. They, and what that means, we talked about it in an earlier episode, but aromatization is the conversion of an androgen into an estrogen. And so it's not just testosterone that can get converted into um, estradiol, which is the most powerful estrogen. Androstenedione, which is also an androgen, can be converted into weaker forms of estrogen. And so not only do we want to look at the pituitary hormones, not only do we want to look at testosterone specifically, but we want to look at what's happening with the potential conversion or overconversion of testosterone into estrogen. Now, men need estrogen. And we'll talk a little bit later about the impact of estrogen in males. And there's some, you know, very interesting research that suggests that potentially, and there's obviously a limit to this, that that higher higher levels of estrogen, as long as we have balance between estrogen and, and androgens or testosterone, higher levels of estrogen may actually be um, cardio and neuroprotective, which is quite interesting because in conventional and functional endocrinology, when it comes to male hormone physiology, it's almost like we were dominated by this thought that we want testosterone to be as high as possible and estrogen to be as low as possible. And then I'm no longer convinced that that's the case. Balance, of course, is very, very important. Um, and, and while I should say balance is almost the most important thing. Um, now, the other thing that you would want to do with male hormone testing is not just look at the relationship between the pituitary hormones, and the testicular output. Not only do we want to look at the potential for aromatization of estrogen, I'm sorry, androgens into estrogens, we also want to look at the spectrum of the three different male-type hormones, which are in order of potency with the lowest first, androstenedione, testosterone, and dihydrotestosterone. Because these hormones can, for example, androstenedione and testosterone can interconvert between each other, and that would a lot of that is actually based on again inflammation and things like stress chemistry, and then testosterone converts into dihydrotestosterone, um, and and doesn't necessarily readily reconvert, but dihydrotestosterone is the most powerful androgen, and while it might be, uh, you know, kind of desirable to have higher amounts of that to have more potency within your androgen system, 
it can cause things like male pattern bald, baldness or um, it can cause benign prostatic hypertrophy. And so obviously we want a limit on how much DHT or dihydrotestosterone is being converted or generated from testosterone. And that conversion process is governed by the male amount of progesterone. Again, we talk about progesterone and estrogens as being female hormones, but men have them, men need them. I have certainly put my fair share of men on um, natural bioidentical forms of progesterone as part of trying to sort out their hormonal profile. Um, so we can't just have this attitude of men can never use female type hormones or vice versa. There's plenty of women running around out there um, with testosterone as part of their hormone replacement therapy. And hopefully it's the appropriate thing to do for them. And so that's really the extent of, of male hormone testing. It's really quite simple. But when we start getting into female testing, you know, the same rules apply in terms of what question are you asking and are we going to test in saliva versus serum? But then what we have to deal with with female hormone systems that we don't with male is the, the reproductive life stage and whether or not we have the menstrual cycle. And the, the interesting thing about this is, we, you know, I said earlier that um, because female hormone profiles change every few days throughout the 28 to 30 day cycle, um, just doing a single test, whether it's in serum or saliva, only gives you a snapshot of that particular day and doesn't allow you to see the whole thing. And so many years ago, some enterprising research people decided that they were going to use saliva testing and, and do saliva samples every three days from the beginning of a cycle to the end to construct what they call a cycle map. And the cycle map can be quite revealing in the sense that we get to see, and obviously the, it, because it's not a sample every single day, let's call a cycle 30 days. Because it's not 30 samples with one sample every day, you know, obviously there's gaps. If you test every third day, you're, you're missing a few days in between. But what it allows the lab to do is to construct this graphical analysis or graphical representation of how the hormones from the, the pituitary gland and the uh, reproductive gonadal system, how those are rising and falling. And so when we look at female menstrual cycle mechanics, we, we divide that roughly 30 day period, let's call it actually 28 days. Um, we, we divide that into two different stages. The first two weeks is what we call the follicular stage. And this is where the cycle actually first begins. And, and on average, uh, women will bleed from, you know, say three days to seven days, and they might have variable flow rates. It might be very heavy bleeding, might be very light bleeding. And all of this can actually be clinical clues as to where and what the issue is if someone has erratic cycles or if they have PMS type symptomatology. A little bit more complicated than I want to get into right now. But nevertheless, the first half of the cycle is called the follicular stage. And, and what is characteristic of that stage is a very low progesterone throughout, it's just not the time to have elevated progesterone. But what we see is we see a surge of follicle-stimulating hormone from the pituitary gland. So that goes up, and that triggers the production of estrogens, particularly estradiol. And so as we approach the midpoint of the female menstrual cycle, estradiol levels rise, which then within a couple of days of the midpoint, let's say the midpoint is day 14, so maybe, you know, day 12, somewhere around there, we get this estrogen surge, which then triggers the production of luteinizing hormone from the pituitary gland. And then luteinizing hormone levels go up right around the mid-cycle, and that triggers the production of progesterone in the second half of the cycle. And so when we, when we look at estrogen specifically estradiol and progesterone and the pituitary hormones, LH and FSH, there is this coordinated dance, if you will, this rhythmic rising and falling where one event happens, which triggers a second event, which triggers a third event, and that triggers a fourth event. And that is spread out over a period of 28 to 30 days on average. And as long as everything works well, what we see is we see the, the onset of menstrual bleeding at the beginning of the cycle for, say, three to five days. We get um, ovulation somewhere around the midpoint of the cycle. And if, if the woman who was cycling did not get pregnant during that cycle, then the whole system resets and it starts over again. Obviously, if there's a pregnancy, then that kind of changes all, all, the, all the parameters, if you will. 
And so the second half of, well, the first half of the cycle, the follicular stage is characterized by an increase in the estrogen level and a very low progesterone level. Once we pass the midpoint of the cycle, that reverses, estrogen levels come down, progesterone levels go up, and that is a hormonal environment that is ripe for sustaining um, a fertilized egg, if it happens. And if it doesn't, there's this innate intelligence in the system that says, hey, we didn't get pregnant this month, let's just clear everything out. And so hormone, hormone levels then dive down as the system clears out, and it's almost like that uh, let's call it a detox and clearance, that clearance of the hormones at the end of the cycle down to kind of a baseline, then triggers the onset of the next cycle. And it's a very beautiful design, uh, very, very rhythmic, very, very dance-like, as I mentioned just a, a little bit before. But again, the problem is, is when someone comes along and says, okay, so we know that we have this 30-ish, 20, 28 to 30-day menstrual cycle where hormones are rising and falling and there's pituitary hormones and there's two different gonadal hormones, but let's just test progesterone and I'll give you a requisition and go to the lab any day that you want and, and let's just test progesterone and estrogen. And the problem with that is, is twofold. Number one is it's a spot check of that one day. And unless you actually ask them, hey, what day in your cycle did you go? You really have no way to compare that to a set of reference values to know if it's normal. But if you don't actually look at the pituitary hormones at the same time, you don't know if there's a problem in a deficit. You don't know if the problem's with the ovaries not responding well, and you don't know if it's from the pituitary not sending a proper signal. Same thing with a man. What's different here with the woman is that whatever paired values you have of pituitary hormones and ovarian hormones, you have to know where in the cycle that was collected. And so there's this general strategy um, particularly when we're dealing with females who have premenstrual symptoms within, say, seven to 10 days of the onset of their, their cycle, then we've kind of devised, and I say we in a collective sense, I wasn't involved in making this decision. Um, we, we tend to say, hey, if we're going to do a spot check, and if we're dealing with post-PMS-type uh, uh, symptomatology, then let's target day 22 of your cycle. Let's Let's test you on day 22, and that way we mitigate some of the downside of doing a spot check, a single test, within the context of a cycle where the hormones are changing every few days. We're just kind of minimizing the potential for error, and we're zeroing in on the, the, the time where progesterone levels should be at their peak, and we have appropriate levels of estrogen during that day. And we can make a better quality decision. Now, some would argue, well, let's do the cycle map. Let's have somebody do a, a saliva test every three days and let's construct this map because it is possible that somebody has something going on in the second half of their cycle that drives their PMS. But it's possible that, they, that the problem that led up to that, that that's really just more of a symptom rather than the true cause, it could be that maybe they didn't have an estradiol peak right before the midpoint and as a result, we didn't get that trigger signal that says, hey, make progesterone. And so if you just throw progesterone in to the cycle at that point, you miss the fact that the problem actually was with um, a lack of, of estrogen signaling in the first half of the cycle. And I don't know if you follow me on that. If not, just kind of hit the hit the rewind button and go through that again. But <clears throat> pardon me, this is this is the the complexity and the intricacy of, of hormonal testing. And you know, understanding the nuances of the system and how that has implications for diagnostics as well as therapeutics. So the the option, let me just kind of summarize in, in just a quick statement. When you're testing hormones in a woman who has her menstrual cycle, yes, we have to still decide between saliva versus serum. Are we doing total and protein bound testing? Or are we doing free fraction testing? We also want to get pituitary hormones as well as the ovarian hormones themselves and look at those paired values to see where the issue is. Is it up top in the brain or is it down bottom, so to speak, in, in the reproductive system? But on top of that, with a woman who has a menstrual cycle, we need to ask ourselves, is it, is it sufficient to do a single test optimized by doing it on 20, day 22 or do we want to do something like a cycle map and take a look at the big picture? And I've done plenty of these cycle maps over the years, and they can be very revealing in some cases. But to kind of tie this into 
what I keep saying I'm going to get to in the next episode, uh, which I think I will. I'm just going to finish this out. We'll talk about the five pillars. You know, even if we can spot whether a woman has a fault or an error in the first half of her cycle or the second, or maybe it's a midpoint issue, whenever we find a hormone deficit, we can pinpoint the mechanism. We're still going to work on the five pillars that these are the these are the systems that undergird hormone balance and control. And so really the main question in testing for female hormones during a menstrual or reproductive life cycle is how much data do we need and do we need to just do it can we do can we get away with doing a single test optimized on day two as long as we're choosing the right type of test and making sure that we're looking at pituitary as well as reproductive hormones. Or do we need to do a, every three days take a saliva sample and then construct a cycle map of both pituitary and ovarian hormones so that we can really spot where the deficit is? And again, pros and cons of each one of those. And that decision is best made on an individual case-by-case -case basis, obviously, or preferably with the um, you know, agreement of whoever, whoever it is that we're working with. I, I like to talk to my individual coaching clients and kind of lay out the options and say, here's what I think is best, but here, you know, we could do it this way for this reason. What do you want to do? I like to do that kind of more of in a collaborative way rather than uh, a dictatorial type of way. And sometimes they say, well, I don't know, doc, you tell me. And then I'll say, okay, let's do it this way. Um, so what about, what about perimenopausal testing? It's very tricky. What is perimenopause, first of all? Um, it, it is a period of time which can be months to years in which a, a woman's hormonal system is becoming uncoupled. And what I mean by that is that the communication between the brain or the pituitary gland and the reproductive organ is, is getting inefficient. And so what ends up happening is um, hormone levels can rise and fall unpredictably. And this is one of the reasons, for example, uh, that a woman going through perimenopause can have things like hot flashes. Uh, hot flashes tend to happen as a, a vasomotor symptom where basically you get rapid dilation of blood vessels and a, and a rapid increase in blood flow. So you get hot, you get sweaty, you get redness, all this kind of stuff. Um, this happens when estrogen actually goes too high. And it's not necessarily how high it goes, but it's the fact that it went from a lower value to a higher value um, fairly rapidly that causes this vascular dilation, delivery of blood, and, and the, the hot flash. And so what happens in the perimenopausal period is that we get this lack of coordination between the brain and the, and the reproductive organ that can create these unpredictable levels and create symptomatology. And so the question then is, is it reasonable in the perimenopausal state to try to assess a hormone level or profile that could be totally different in six hours or in six days. And so I tend to not do hormone testing in the perimenopausal period. I, I prefer to actually start looking at what are the, the pillars? How are you doing in these five different areas that we need to assess? Because I understand that how easily or how gracefully one woman goes through perimenopause into the postmenopausal period is going to be completely predicated on how much metabolic control that she has in these five pillar areas that we will talk about next episode. Let me say it another way. Whatever, whatever metabolic junk someone has going on in their body that's causing erratic hormones in the, in the perimenopausal state is what they bring with them into the postmenopausal state. And so if you don't sort that out ahead of time, um, these, are, these are the women who really have a hard time with the perimenopausal transition and continue to have symptoms in the postmenopausal period. If, however, we have an opportunity, either during the perimenopausal state or, or preferably even before that, before they hit that, if we get a chance to assess and then sort out or improve these five pillars of hormone balance and control, then we radically can improve their transition during the perimenopausal state because we don't get these erratic shifts and changes in hormones that are responsible for perimenopausal symptomatology. 
and we set them up for success in the postmenopausal period of time because again whatever metabolic imbalances or state of control that you have going into perimenopause is what you take with you into menopause which is which is how we account for the wide range of functional symptoms uh, between women that are in those different stages. I mean, you, you might have, you know, let's say that you're listening and you're a female. Maybe not, maybe, but maybe you have a wife or a family member who's going through perimenopause right now. And, you know, they're suffering. You know, they have migraines, they have headaches, they have the hot flashes, their sleep is all disrupted. Maybe they've got some changes in body composition. Well, what's the difference between that woman and maybe maybe her friend or family member who's roughly the same age going through the same transition and they're not suffering or not suffering to the same degree. Well, I would argue that the difference between the two is how much control and stability do they have in the five pillars that undergird hormone balance and control. The more metabolic control and balance you have, the easier the transition will be and the better your postmenopausal state would be. Which then brings us to testing for postmenopausal female. And one of the big things is going to be whether or not they're actually already on hormone replacement therapy and specifically whether they are on synthetic hormones. Because remember, labs, no, like there are no labs that measure synthetic hormones. They, they only measure bioidentical, which means that if you, if I have a woman who comes in and, and, and they're on some kind of synthetic estrogen or progesterone, and they want me to test their hormones, I, I will tell them, well, I'm not sure we should do that because whatever the number is on the, on the lab report, your hormone levels are going to be different because there are synthetic hormones in your body that the test can't see. And so you actually end up with um, a, a completely inaccurate picture of what the hormone profile is, and you don't even know how inaccurate it is. Is, is it off by 5% or is it off by 50%? We don't really know. So that makes it a little bit problematic. And so, you know, just like in the perimenopausal state where hormone levels are fluctuating a lot, and it doesn't really make sense to do spot testing or even cycle mechanic, like a cycle map test on a woman in the, in the perimenopausal period. Let's just, let's go straight to the five fundamental pillars and let's assess that platform. The same holds true pretty much of the woman in the postmenopausal state. Now that might change if someone is not on hormone therapy or if they are on bioidentical hormones where we can trust the lab test to give us an accurate picture of what the hormone profile is. And so hormone testing becomes much more valuable, if you will, um, during the reproductive life stage where someone has a menstrual cycle or should have a menstrual cycle just because of their age, but maybe they're erratic and they're skipping cycles, maybe maybe they're having more frequent bleeding. Nevertheless, testing is, I think, very appropriate there. But once you get into the perimenopausal and postmenopausal state, it's best to get busy just evaluating the fundamental pillars first without actually worrying about whether or not they have enough estrogen and testosterone. Now, again, I said that might change if someone's on bioidentical hormones. And the question is, how is your protocol working for you? I certainly would advocate testing in that case, and, and I would advocate uh, the use of free fraction testing, which we get by nature in saliva testing. And depending on the lab we access, then we might be able to get that in uh, serum testing as well. And again, I'm not pro serum or saliva. It just depends. I, I want to use the right tool for the right job, I guess is the best way to say that. So that's your, your quick overview of, uh, and I guess finishing off the concept of, of testing hormones. Remember, just kind of big picture you have to not only test, well, let's start with, you have to decide up front, are you looking at production or are you looking at biological availability? So that's the difference between doing, uh, say, serum testing versus saliva testing in general. Then we have to think about testing pituitary hormones in conjunction with the reproductive hormones themselves in matched pairs. In women, luteinizing hormone and progesterone, follicle-stimulating hormone and estrogen. In men, luteinizing hormone and um, in testosterone. Um, once we get past that, if it's male physiology, we will also want to look at the potential for aromatization, converting testosterone into estrogens. And we also want to look at the balance between the three different types of male hormones, androstenedione, testosterone, dihydrotestosterone. 
Switching over to female physiology, everything kind of hinges on whether or not they're in their reproductive stage or if they're peri- or postmenopausal. I'm not going to review it just because we just talked about that in the last few minutes. So I hope, I, I think you find that helpful. I, I will tell you that when we get clinicians and, and healthcare practitioners coming to the functional medicine seminars that I've taught over the last 10 years or so, um, the, the clinician version of this, which has a lot more detail, um, is an eye-opening aha moment for most people who are working uh, with men and women as it relates to hormones. Uh, it's that That is what I just went through in the last 30 minutes or so, um, actually the last couple of episodes, is um, a, let's call it a consumer-friendly version of what I teach in these functional medicine seminars, and certainly it's what I use in, in my clinical practice. Hope that helps, and we'll see you next time where I promise we will get to the five pillars of hormone balance and control. Thanks again for being part of the Inflammation Nation. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much for listening to the Inflammation Nation. If you found this episode valuable, please rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast. Be the first to know when a new episode drops so that you can stay on top of your game. It also helps others like you find the answers they need. And why not head over to my main website, drnoseworthy.com, that's drnoseworthy.com, to explore my personalized functional medicine coaching programs, submit a question to the podcast, maybe take a quiz, or even reach out to me using the contact form that you can find there. We'll see you next time.